everyone. I'm Kevin Minty. I'm a professor of art at Northern Kentucky University, and it's my pleasure today for SODA to welcome Beth Ann Moran Hanslick. She was actually my painting teacher for Painting One. So welcome. It's good to have you with us today. Very good to meet you again, Kevin. I haven't seen you in a while and just a real honor to be part of your community and podcast today. Mm -hmm. So I've recently watched a podcast with you on it, and you talked about your sort of introduction to art. Uh, could you share that with some of our viewers? And I recently myself saw the Carl von Marr painting just over Christmas break. I was blown away. But if yeah. you want to share that experience with our viewers, that'd be great. Yeah, I think we all have these um, deep kind of senses that we are visual people and artists, but um, I grew up in West Bend, Wisconsin, and we were fortunate to have this collection of Kara von Marr paintings. And this painting that Kevin just mentioned, that you mentioned, Kevin, is massive. Uh, it is 22 feet long, 13 feet high. It is a procession down a medieval city. And you could just walk, you walked in at at the top of the painting because there was a balcony then you go down this little promenade up to the painting and it just was it was a powerful painting and from that point forward after seeing that and then the procession of all of his other paintings I just knew there was something about this thing oil painting that that riveted me and that was really the, the catalyst I think it, it, paintings matter they do. And, yeah. you know, here I'm a professional and I didn't know about that collection. And I went up there over Christmas break and when we were in Wisconsin and I turned the corner and saw the paint, I was like, oh, my goodness. And then, yeah. you know, I'm taking detailed pictures of it and just really getting up close and looking at it. And every single person that would turn that corner to be like, wow, oh my goodness. Like, right. and nobody know. well, people are starting yeah. to know about it, but it's such a gem. Yeah, and his other paintings are are marvelous. They're just marvelous, yeah. So the, the new museum is absolutely beautiful, but the old museum, it was in this big dark room and it gave it this cachet of even more, um, like a different context than the white wall kind of broad lit gallery space. So, and I was in second grade when that happened. So it was, it was very powerful. That's cool. And so yeah. you've been making artwork for a long time since you were a child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Maker. I mean, not just painting, but all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so you've talked about that Carl von Marr painting. Who are some of your other artistic heroes? Well, historically, um, I've got a couple of big ones. I mean, I love Rem Rembrandt. Um, I also very much like um, Bastien Lepage. I, I love the Joan of Arc painting of his at the Met. Um, Milwaukee Art Museum in my home state, uh, they have the woodcutter. I love that painting. The way that he paints the flora and fauna of the ground, it's so, it's so layered. Uh, it's not an indirect painting process in the traditional sense of creating a grisaille and all of that, but it is an indirect process in that I always feel like he's wrestling with the paint to make the make the thing come into its reality. And, and I, I just, so I really respond to LePage. Um, yeah, there's so many yeah. people. You, William you, Nicholson. You feel he wrestles with the paint. When I yeah. look at that painting at the uh, Milwaukee Art Museum, because I always, anytime yeah. I'm in Milwaukee, I go and see it. I don't think he struggles with it at all. It's just like, I look at it, I'm like, he makes it look so easy and effortless. And I'm just, it's a struggle for me all the time. Yeah, exactly. It's a struggle for me all the time too. But that's what I see in LePage. Like, I don't see it as, as I mean, the, the result is incredible, right? But what I don't see is I don't see like, so many of the, um, so many people who are really academically trained, even like a Bouguereau, there's a Bouguereau right around the corner from that. There's this appearance of these smooth, beautiful veils of paint. There's, it, it's, it's, it's a different aesthetic. I mean, 
gorgeous, beautiful aesthetic. But with LePage, I feel like he's like, okay, I'll put this down. Now I'll rough cut this over. Now I'm going to re-see this. Now I see this next to that. Now I'm going to slash this over that. And so there's like this kind of physicality, sculptural building that that does feel like a wrestling match. I feel like I'm in that wrestling match so much where I'll scrape something back. And then that scrape back residue is exactly what I needed to build whatever it is with clarity on top of it. And so I see him as this weirdly coming in the back door to the reality and the ease of his painting, which, you know, is really... I, I don't know. And, and then the way that he constructs the flesh tones and the um, facial features, they're, they're much more refined. Uh, it's almost a different kind of painting going on there. And so, yeah, that's what I mean by wrestling. He's, he's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think all it, painters wrestle. <laughs> yeah. We but, all wrestle. And, and I, I, I think that that's a really interesting observation that you that you put forth because when I look at your work um, you could think of Russell as struggle but you could also think of Russell as we're in it this is what we're yeah. doing right now yeah. and when I look at your paintings I see that constant like like you show up and you're not really sure what's gonna happen uh, that's yeah. what we do that's and it. then and then you're in it and you're yeah. just you you forget what's going on it's not yeah. like a, B, C, D. It's, exactly. Oh, the light just shifted. I have to do this. Oh, yeah. the wind just blew. I have to rethink this because that leap is no longer there. And, and you just, you go with it. Yes. Yeah. And, and sometimes that is to the detriment of the painting outcome. And sometimes it adds to my frustration, but it, it is um, in effect, my method, non-method that always, it, it has a, a cornerstone of clarity to me, but then it's a free rambling thing that I do get kind of swept up in. You nailed it, Kevin. Oh, <laughs> you have better insight into my painting, I think, than I do. <laughs> no, it's it's just I think, and, and maybe that comes from plain air painting. I think yeah. so many people need some sort of like uh, recipe as mm -hmm. to how something's done, and yeah. when you're out there in the landscape, you're trying to make it work and you're doing whatever you can and it, it's not like uh one size fits all it's you're doing anything you can to try to make sense of what you're seeing yeah exactly um the painter stanley lewis is someone that you know in a distant way i kind of identify with uh he's a little more eccentric in that habit but um yeah you have to just get in the ring and 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 kind of fight it out and enjoy all of the you know little changes that happen along the way so that's what makes it so exciting and engaging for me i'm i'm not as maybe analytic when it comes to the process i love the analytic process outside of painting and i do find myself um like really hypercritical when i come in from painting for a long time where i haven't been you know in my thinking intellect critical mind i come in and i'm I, sometimes I'm just destroyed. I, I just, I'm just like, what the heck am I doing? This just looks like a big old mess. And I just get really discouraged. And then something gives me heart to say, go back out there. You can get this, you can do this. <laughs> you know? And then I go try again and, and slowly it's a balance and it evolves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things uh, that I've seen on your resume is that you were given that prestigious Hudson River School uh, yeah. fellowship or residency, can you talk about painting in New York in the Hudson River Valley and how that went? Yeah, we were actually in New Hampshire for that oh. um, for that particular year. Um, it it's an I put a slide in there of one of the paintings that I did, Kevin. So if you see it later, you can pull it up. It just uh that was 2014, and I really thought, hey, you know what? I'm way too old to do this. They're, they want young people to do this, and and then my husband just said, just do it. You 
apply. Why not? And I really had never taken a workshop at that point. I um, I just was so invested in teaching that that was kind of my proverbial workshop for myself, thinking through things in the studio with the students. But yeah, I drove to New Hampshire. There was a group of artists who were um, invited and they provided the housing and everything for you to be there for three weeks. And then you just painted together. You went out in landscape every day. I think I made about 35 or 40 paintings over three weeks, um, which was a you know pretty good number of paintings, lots of studies. I really didn't completely, I thought maybe there would be a little more guidance or like leadership instruction. But later I found out that that particular year was when um, Grand Central Atelier was moving from I think their Water Street location um, to, to where they are. Well, no, I think they just moved again, actually. But anyway, they were in a move. So some of the people that I thought I might meet there weren't there. But I did paint with um, Katie Lydiard, um, Jennifer Keltos, Cesar Santos, um, James Eddings. There were just so Edmonds. There were lots of people there who we were all just, you know, kind of finding our way and enjoying that. So... Yeah, yeah, lots of positive energy there. Yes, and I would say to anyone who has an interest or fascination in painting plein air landscape, especially in that um, Hudson River tradition, I would look at their website, see if that is offered again. Now I know they're doing it at another location, but just apply, just go ahead and apply. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain from just putting it out there to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah what quotes or ideas sort of help you motivate yourself in the studio or in life or just help you get through day to day yeah um well um we always grew up with love your neighbor you know as yourself that that's a good one mm -hmm. um my mom would always say uh steer your horses grab the reins and steer your horses not not hold your horses, but steer them because she knew there was life and energy to guide us. And so every now and then I find myself saying to myself, just steer your horses, Beth Ann. Get figure out where you want to go and grab those reins. They're going to take you somewhere. So I say that to myself sometimes. But um as far as painting goes, there's a book that I love. And I, I actually have it right here. It's not, it's I mean, I can quote part of it, Kevin, but it's a really profound uh quote that. I like to think about a lot and I think about it like I've been thinking about this for years and it just simply does make a lot of sense to me. Is it okay if I read it? Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. So this is the book. It's um, Art and Reality by Joyce Carey. It's very old, but he's writing about, you know, like what it, how we arrive at the arts and if there's any truth within the arts. And he says, it's only in great art that the logic of the subconscious where judgment has become part of the individual emotional character that we move freely in a world which is at once concept and feeling, rational order and common emotion. So it's rational order and common emotion. And here's the part I love. In a dream which is truer than actual life and a reality which is only there made actual, complete, and purposeful to our experience. And that last part, you know, in a dream, which is truer than actual life and a reality there in the painting made true to our life, you know, made purposeful to our life. I think about that because when I think about um, all the individual stylistic approaches of painting that I love, like um, I, I have a little bit of a love affair going on with some of the um, painters at Grand Central Atelier. Katie Whipple is one of them. And her paintings, they are a dream which is truer than actual life because there, there's, there's, they're condensed. You know, they're, they're, it's a new reality that she's presenting. And Ted Minoff in those wave paintings, Yes, he's going out painting those plein air, the smaller studies, but then from his notes and invention, like Hudson River School, he's inventing this new reality, which does have a lot of conceptual ideas in it for me when I look at those paintings. Um, and that's his kind of go at the reality. And then 
this other guy, Travis Schlott, who I did get to go to um, Grand Central Atelier to do a portrait workshop. It was my first workshop I've ever gone to. It was amazing. And um, painting with Ted Minoff and Travis Schlott, watching those two paint was just so helpful and wonderful for me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that dream, which is truer than actual life. And so I always think about that with my own painting, like, what is it we're at? What is it we're after in your paintings? Your paintings, Kevin, are a dream, which is truer than actual life, because you kind of present almost like a, a condensed novella in a lot of your work, because there's, there's not just the, not, I'm not going to say not just because it makes the other sound pejorative, but there's like an agenda that says, yes, this is retinal, aesthetic, something to look at, and it is persuasive politically, socially, um, intellectually. And that's that's why the painting is a dream that is truer than actual life, because we don't see life unfold like that. And, and the other thing is about that is painting is so phenomenal because you see the painting all at once, but you also find it incrementally over time. And so that that's a quote that I come back to and I, I think about. That's awesome. And thank you for those kind words. Like Your paintings I'm, are great. Oh, thanks. As you were talking about that, I was thinking about uh, just all the great paintings have that stuff. I was like, think about like Picasso's old guitarist. Like, yeah. it, you know, there's so many layers um, and it feels like a dream but it's very real and yeah. um yeah and, and that's uh, the, yeah the first part of that quote is that rational order and emotional character you're bringing you're bringing those two things together and so in even in like a Gerhard Richter full on abstraction feeling very non objective in the way that it's made that is a dream which is truer than actual life for me, you know, when I look at that thing. So it's not just about representational painting or observational painting or paint, paintings made in a certain material. It seems to, you know, cross a lot mm -hmm. of boundaries. Yeah. Well, what would you like people to know about your work or your life as an artist? Mm. Um, I would like them to know that I am struggling with the notion of what it means to think of painting as a prosthetic of vision. And I think of like a prosthesis enables, it enables someone to do something that they need to do. And so painting for me is like this prosthetic of vision because it is, I mean, Kevin, painting is one of these very few places where we can say, I am looking, I am looking and I'm going to give you that looking in the same language as looking. I'm I'm looking and I'm giving you the paint, giving you the thing in the same language as looking. My proof is in the same language. Do you know what I mean? Like I we don't have photography doesn't do that, not quite. It it's more momentary, but to look and then present in the same language as looking to enable vision. And the enabling of vision is for me, the painter, but it's also for my audience. I mean, painting is a prosthetic of vision for me. And I, I'm, I know I'm gonna, whether I want to or not, I'm spending my life doing that. I'm trying to, to look carefully to bring about some vision that will help someone at the point where they need it, hopefully on their path to joy. And that doesn't mean the painting's always going to be joyful. It might be that the painting it hits, strikes a somber note, but it enables them to move forward in some path toward joy, connected humanity, and like, you know, like a heightened sense of consciousness, even if momentarily and even if just shallowly. But I'm trying. That's what I'm trying for. I think you do a good job of that. You, you're, <laughs> sh you're sharing your vision with the world. And I think that that's a really... Uh, honest way to go about things I think it's a very humble way to go about things and I think it's a very vulnerable way to go about things in terms of like you go to these places and you sit and you observe for long periods of time when the 
rest of the world is doing all sorts of things. They're sitting at their computers, they're doing work, they're sad about something, they're happy about something. And whatever you decide to choose to paint on that particular day, you're sort of bearing your soul through your vision. And I think that that's a really good way and an honest way to touch other people because I don't think we do that enough uh, these days in terms yeah. of just sharing that experience of looking. Yeah, I think it's just such a strange compulsion, you know, and it it is at times very hard and it does take some some grit to keep doing it. And sometimes in as culture and society shifts and changes, it does at times feel passe. At times it feels um, from a climate perspective, kind of a heavy thing to do. Um, I, I just, I wrestle with all of that so much. And um, sometimes I think the, maybe the next form of, of that is actually having conversations like what you're doing even with these podcasts. Uh, there's a podcaster, Lex Fridman. Do you know his his podcast? No, I he's don't. Out, he's out of MIT, and he always meets with his guest in person. They're, they they record it side by side, but he's always in the room with them. And um, he's an AI guy. He's really interested in creating this next tier of robots. And but he's he's such a um, a person to delve deep into the human uh, experience and. When I listen to the podcasts, I'm in cleaning brushes or scraping a painting down or whatever it is. Um, they're just they're very powerful in a sense. They're almost like paintings to me. They almost mimic what you just said in that kind of making yourself available and vulnerable to the like transient nature of our experience, you know. So so let's talk about your experiences painting in terms of yeah. most of the time I ask people like, what's your studio like and yeah this is my space of, but a lot of times your studio is outside and yeah yeah you talk about your favorite places to paint or favorite environments to paint yeah i i paint a lot kind of close to home frequently um my backyard is a recurring spot um, I really like that, that shallow depth of field right now where I'm looking down and slightly up. Um, that's been going on for a number of years. Um, I do like to paint vistas, but not, they're just, they have, they hold a, such a different emotional register for me than, um, that more shallow space. Um, so my backyard is a big one. We have a beehive, we have apple trees. There's this rock right outside the studio door that I'm I don't know why I'm so compelled by that thing, but I, I keep putting things on it and painting them in all different seasons. Um, and then we have a little place up north in the woods and I love painting there as well. And then occasionally I'll just go driving around and I'll have like a 50 inch panel in my car and I'll just uh, pull up somewhere and ask someone if I can paint at their house. And they never know what they're getting into when they say yes, but you know, they, they mm -hmm. learn. We learn together. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it, I, I would love to just be driving along and just see you on the side of the road painting. That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes my people friend, honk at me. <laughs> yeah. My friend Joe, my friend Joe Haymeister, who went to okay. uh, UWM. I know Joe. Yeah. He, I think he shows with you, at, or I don't know if he's still showing at Ed. Edgewood Orchard Gallery and oh. he showed at Tory Foley are both yeah. places you show at yeah but he told me once uh I believe him but it sounds so far-fetched he's like he went out and he was um he saw this farm and he was like uh do you mind if I he went to the farmer and said do you mind if I you know paint your cows and the next day he came and there was a cow that was like tied to oh um, wow a tree and i don't know if the farmer even thought he was like actually going to like put paint to the cow but, <laughs> but um i never had that uh i've always tried to paint in a more stealth like mode i i've had i i get intimidated by having to ask somebody if i could paint um on their property so yeah. i've snuck onto property and tried to paint uh yeah that way 
Okay. One time when I was I was teaching at Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi, and there were cotton fields that were in bloom in the moonlight. And I didn't ask permission. I just went out just past this field and like the moonlight was on the cotton field and it was slightly in bloom. So there was like this almost like hovering, almost Mark Rothko like effect. Maybe there was some moisture in the air also I don't know but um I went back on this property and I heard all these cows started to bray or moo or whatever they do and I could hear it getting louder and louder and then I hear these dogs and I'm picking up my gear and I'm running through this field that's just mucky and wet I got back to the car and the light had just started to change and I could see that there was a clear barrier between the where the cows were and where I was but it it scared me like nothing else to you know be out there. You just don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you had other visitors while you've been painting? I, I think you oh, probably yeah. have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now I I mean I've done a bunch of the plein air events, so that's one kind of visitor, and it's it's fun. You're in a different atmosphere. But when I'm making these larger paintings on site for three or four weeks the animals around you, they just totally acclimate to your presence. So um, I did a large sunflower painting. Uh, birds would come and alight right on the edge of the canvas. Um, there, there was a painting in which a hummingbird came and just smacked itself right into the painting and dropped to my feet and then got up and flew away. Um, another time I had on this, this was up north, I had on this big emerald green headscarf. And this hummingbird was like, just coming and attacking my head, but deer, you know, it's just, yeah, lots of animals and it's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to watch out for those hummingbirds. When I was doing a artist residency uh, at Rocky mountain national uh, park, my wife, Tammy and I, we would sit on the deck and just watch the elk pass. And at this, we had these rain jackets. Hers were like, they were like really bright orange and bright green. Oh yeah. And the the male hummingbirds, yeah. I thought th I think they thought we were intruding in their territory. And I mean, they would just like be like right here. You're yes. worried that they're gonna take your eye out. They're just so scary. I mean, everyone <laughs> thinks they're these sweet little creatures. They're really aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So could you share with us uh, some of your favorite things? I, I know probably being out in the uh, in nature painting is one of them, but what are some yeah. other things that you enjoy? Um, I really love cooking. I love my garden. Uh, I mean, my family is number one. We have three kids, my husband, we just enjoy each other's company. Um, but I, I love gardening. I love cooking. Um, you know, I enjoy reading and uh I don't know, good movies, all kinds of things are part of our life. We we travel a lot and uh, we're going back to Scotland. I'm going to get to teach again, which I am really looking forward to. I'm going to teach a, a drawing field course while we're in Scotland. And so it will all be on site. And uh, we've been there a couple of times in the past through study abroad programs that my husband and I have taught at. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. So um, yeah, I've I've seen that you've drawn or you've painted, you've done master copies uh, of Rembrandt and Velasquez yep. um, uh, at the National Gallery there. And yeah, uh, it's like, awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, who are some of your favorite teachers or influences and mentors that you've had over the years? Yeah, I I've really had so many really good people. I. Um, in my undergrad, while my my primary teacher for painting, he wasn't a painter, but he was a photographer, was his main um, focus. And he, James Cagle, he he was just a really generous, um, insightful. Um, I don't know, just he had a really good eye, like his compositional skills, and then value. He he conveyed a lot of things not directly about painting, but about thinking about works of art. And so I really valued that. I had good teachers in high school. Um, and, and then at UWM, when I was there, I was there for, you know, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, um, for the graduate program. John Colt was just, he was just what I needed. And Tom Utech, they, um, John now has died I a, a while ago, but, um, 
he and Tom, they really, the, their view of nature and the conversations we had about painting and nature, that, that was so evocative to me, even though at that point I wasn't painting as much from direct observation in an open way. Um, but those conversations really stuck with me. And now um, Tom and I have just started talking again and kind of sharing stories. And so he he continues to be a friend and mentor in a sense, um, really enjoy him and his work. So, yeah. yeah. And, and then so many teachers in so many other ways, Kevin, I don't know about you, but I think of all my, te all my students, they're kind of like my teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then painting itself. Oh, student of painting. Their yeah. painting itself is my is my grandmaster teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Humbles I had me. one I had one <laughs> class with Tom Utek and it was reading works of art and just looking at art for so long like mm -hmm. certain paintings I learned so much uh, and I, I think one of those things um I, I do think that workshops are good and like you know you can do something a, B, C, D, this is the way it goes, but just also just looking at things and trying to yes. figure them out for yourself. And yes. the Velasquez that you copied at the National Gallery in, in um, Scotland, I remember looking at that painting in Tom Utex class. We looked at that thing for an hour. Like how many yeah. classes do you have that are art classes where uh, not necessarily art history classes, but just you're looking at a single image for hours at times. Like yeah. you learn so much. You do. You know, Kevin, that's such an important point because not only do you learn so much about the mindset of Velasquez and really intimately get to know that painting, but it also teaches you about the painter's predisposition to looking. You know, it really helps helps to hone that because when you're when you're making your own work, you're watching and looking at so much. You're looking at your subject, at the painting evolve, at the thoughts that are crossing your own mind. Like there's so much attending to the looking. And wow, that's incredible. What a great, great story. I loved hearing that. Um, I, in some ways, I I wish I had been an undergraduate student. I mean, I, I'm I don't want to take anything away from my undergraduate experience because it was good. But, you know, I always want to fold more in. And I just think that that would have been really cool to have had Tom or any of those people as a, you know, undergrad. Yeah. But you can learn so much from all different. Yeah. All different teachers. And so that one of the reasons why I do this is because I want, I, I want, ceramic students i want photography students i want drawing students i want visual communication students i want art education students to learn from all of these different realms and today when i was carpooling with my friend francois Leroy, who is the he's sort of the head of study abroad at our school and he's an incredible photographer although he's never like been listed as a photographer but yeah. he talked about hunting the image um yeah. as a photographer and it's like yeah I mean yeah. that's what every single artist should be doing is hunting yeah. the image trying to find just that perfect composition the perfect light textures whatever it could be yeah that's what we're all after yeah, and I, I think even more than artists, it's it's in our human nature to to aspire to that in some way, shape, and form. And it expresses itself in so, you know, I mean, the diversity of how we are creative in this world is amazing. It's unbelievable. Everything from a screwdriver, who invented a screwdriver? I mean, that's an incredible invention right there. <laughs> and that's that's the hunting. That's the hunting. Um, there was this composer when I was teaching at Skidmore College in upstate New York, um, this composer, Jonathan Daniel Poor came, and he was composing for orchestration, but he would sit down at the piano and he said, um, playing the piano was a catalyst for ideas. Playing the piano was a catalyst for ideas. So 
sometimes I think when people think about hunting for an image, like your friend, um, they think that you, you're you're looking for it and then you're going to do it. But in da in Jonathan Daniel Poor's you know explanation, it's not that the thing is over there and you you find it. It's that you actively do the thing that leads you into that moment because you can't get to the end result without a lot of messy stuff in between <laughs> in my in my experience so you, that that's the quote right there you know um yeah. everybody wants it just like served up and you yeah. have to suck at something for a while or you have to struggle with something for a while before you can sometimes find that sheer bliss of wow i can actually do this rather well now <laughs> but yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I'm even there yet. Occasionally, uh, you, occasionally I get the bliss. <laughs> you're there. Keep me going. So, so let's take a look. I think the proof is in the pudding. Let's take a look at some of your paintings. Here's a, is this a recent painting that you've done? Um, that wasn't this winter. It was the previous winter. So one year ago, February. This painting has some of the qualities that you were talking about, sort of the intimacy the intimate view of almost like looking down. It's not a vista. Can you, is this in your backyard or? Yep. That's our beehive right in the backyard. Um, uh, the Frisbee literally was out there. I did kick it over a little bit to move it <laughs> into the composition a little bit more. But if you look down, you, you know, you can see someone when they're in front of this painting, Kevin, their, their gesture is that you literally see their gesture change. They look down at the Frisbee and then slightly up toward the, the little metal urn on top of the um, beehive. And I really was, you know, I was kind of struck afterward. Usually my ideas about the paintings come to me after, but I think it really was an idea about um, like the way the Frisbee does sort of foreshadow the summer to come, the blue sky of the summer skies to come, or maybe summer past. And then the beehive itself, I, I'm really infatuated with the beehive because those bees are so incredible, number one, but there's always that promise of sweetness in there, all the honey, and it's unseen. You know, it's like this seen, unseen kind of mystery. So that's part of what that painting is about. As I'm looking at it, there's things I'm seeing, like we have these two elliptical images of the Frisbee and of the urn. And one seems very sort of serious and the other seems more playful. And uh, in some ways there, I think I see this almost as sort of uh, a memory or a tribute to things past, like the summer's past and now we're in winter. And this is a time of like contemplation and mourning and, and then the the dark background really weighs down on on the viewer. I almost wonder if that also contributes to the viewer like taking that looking down. Uh, looking down. It, there's this, this like Mark Rothko esque almost inversion of this heavy dark image on top of this light image, and I think that visual weight really makes people contemplate about what's what's going on. So. Yeah. Well, and also the Frisbee being plastic and such a bright color itself, if you remove that from the painting, uh, the painting does get super somber, like uh, very <laughs> melancholy and very serious, especially with the shadows and whatnot. But um, yeah, the, the Frisbee seems to be key to the levity of you know, like what was past and what is anticipated. And I think it does sort of also help you kind of reimagine the, you know, the hive itself and the honey and all of that. So. Mm -hmm. And here, this is you working on site yep. with it. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, that's just one of its stages. It went through the snow kind of came and went in that one. And mm -hmm. um, I'd put, put it in one way, then cover it up then try it another way. Just kept moving with it. Let's see. And there, there's a detail of it. Yeah. Yeah, the detail of it. I don't know if you can zoom into that anymore, Kevin, but I, I just wanted to show or share with you. Yeah, like that little vertical line, um, those little cut lines in the paint. In yeah, like that's that's not about anything other than measuring, reseeing, retacking. 
it kind of ties back to in a different way what we were talking about um lepage's work um and then the way the wind sort of moves the snow this is kind of another invisible force but we get to see the invisible force through the movement of that kind of little scumbling veil of snow mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of antonio lopez garcia in that like little like check, yeah i love check, that guy check. yeah I love that guy. I never want to try to like mimic that to be performative, but it does come up in the work because, you know, a, a blade edge of a, a palette knife edge is really helpful for making some indicators. And some of those, they end up being like these abstract, beautiful marks that, you know, are rival any kind of illusionism that I can, um, you know, strike upon. So I leave them. Do you want to talk about this one or? Sure. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so this is on the rock right in the backyard and, um, you know, just like 20 paces up and it's called Before the Snow. It was right before the snow. I bought that Helleborus painting. And this one, you really, it's really sort of a more looking down than it is back up, but you get a little bit of that flux. Um, I've been painting those gloves for a couple of years now, and I really love the way that the gloves sort of are a surrogate for any, really anyone's hands. Um, this one has another kind of, I guess, somber sort of quality to it, but it also to me is um, very hopeful, very real in its emotional, whatever, candor. Some yeah, details. Okay. Yeah, that's detail. paint. And I, I think you've eloquently uh, at times described just oil paint can become anything uh yeah I, yeah yeah and here like if you compare if just for the sake of um looking at this like the the thinness of the paint in the glove even like some of these little little tiny hatching marks the paint there is quite thin and then if you go back one um to the other then in this place you see the paint um you know, really kind of heavy impasto describing that that little floral form and a very broken kind of brush mark going on. So like the painting is always in this kind of little push and pull, thick and thin, very dynamic kind of surface. And I, I'm not trying to control that in a sense of like a method moving forward. It, it sort of evolves itself. Look at your studio companion out there. Yep. And there's my my good dog. She's always with me. Yeah. One of the things I liked about the way you taught us to paint is I feel like I don't need to know how to paint something. I just paint. And in the process of that, I'll figure out how to paint a glove or a rock or the petals on a flower. And And that's one of the things that I wish I could communicate better to my students because I think they always want to know, like, how do I paint blank? And it's like, yeah, well, you put this shape next to this shape. You feel if that shape is thick or thin, um, yeah. like, and it like magically like happens, but just you have to almost like throw yourself off the cliff and believe that you'll figure it out and <laughs> and yeah and i think so often we don't have that sort of trust in in ourselves or that trust in the process and um i think that just have you you have to like wrestle getting back to that you have to wrestle with it for a while and then you're like well yeah i'll figure this out eventually mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there are a couple of things there, like when kids are little, that's essentially what they do. And they find very deep satisfaction in that, you know, their purposefulness is in looking at it and then claiming their own space of how to make it. I do think, though, and I know from your own painting, um, you know, you have to have that foundation of how the theory, the theory of how light hits a form, the theory of how color interaction is relative and how it basically works. You have to know chemically, you know, kind of how your materials work and then and then get to that point where when you're actually when you have that foundation and then you're you're wrestling with that subject, it is for me 
less intellectual and more about a felt experience of the work. And, and, but it has to rely in some way on, on that foundation if you're trying to express a, a dimensional illusional reality um, that other people then can feel. Because I think what, what students very frequently do early on is they go to kind of a, a very smooth, very um, like soft, very soft edges, soft. There's a softness to the way they wanna paint that makes everything feel a little <laughs> interchangeable. And then you gotta just change that up a bit. Find find your nature. Yeah. <laughs> I always like to say that. Find yeah. your nature. And this is this is one of my favorite paintings that um, you've brought to show us today. Oh, um, thanks. It hangs with all of the great landscape painters from Van Gogh to Daubigny, and uh, it's I, I've always tried to welcome spring by doing a blossoming tree painting on site. Uh, and uh, could you talk a little bit about this particular painting? Well, that is very high praise, Kevin. Thank you for that. Um, uh, yeah, this is again in the backyard. It's exactly the same beehive. Um, you can see that tree behind it kind of leaning a little bit. Um, that same metal urn is on top because our bees, we give them lots of um, places to drink water. And um, so that's on the top there. And so this evolved over maybe um, three weeks, I'm going to say. I'm, I'm doing another painting of this tree right now. And then um, I have two 60 by 60s for one is going to be a springtime painting again. And I'm going to evolve it differently. Sometimes I paint too long. Uh, I wish I could get out earlier. I'm going to kind of work toward that this year. Um, but this is about I think 56 or so wide. I can't remember the height dimension, but yeah, it's a bigger painting. Yeah, so this is the start of that painting. And there's something about the tonality of this start and the kind of bringing the draw. I wanna bring the drawing back into the painting more in the later stages so that it has that kind of energy to it. So I really, I really loved the start of this. And then, you know, you can't leave it. I can't leave it there. I got to figure out what to do next. So I'm always, you know, figuring that out. Um, so this is just one day painting and it gives you the sense of the size. And you might be like, well, where's your easel? Why aren't you, why isn't that up in the air? Well, it usually would be up higher, but on this particular day, it was really windy and very hot. So we just trapped the painting between two metal chairs and that kind of helped me keep going that day so and then there's another one here I think I think I yeah. put a whole bunch in of this one because I thought so yeah. that's the painting up on the easel and it's it's almost complete there um and it kind of gives you a, a sense that you can really see how when you look past the painting toward that apple tree um the blossoms are now gone and I'm still working on the painting. And so a lot of the painting is direct observation, but this memory, imagination, invention, this accumulation of experience, it's all really part of my process. So this is a detail of the sky, just mm -hmm. to give you a sense of how loose those blossoms are. And then there's one more. Oh yeah, this one. So you can kind of see that kind of I was trying to make this visual rhythm move up under the beehive, like this curve, and then it kind of moved up. It trailed up into the sky. Like I started to see these other rhythms moving in the painting, and I tried to push those. There's an accumulation of ideas that happen throughout the painting. And a lot of times, I know that you've probably experienced this. People are like, oh, it looks so real. and it is real, but let's talk about that idea that we've talked about earlier. It's like, this is kind of real, but it's kind of a dream because yeah. half of it took place while the tree was in bloom, some of it didn't. So it's like, you've accumulated all of these experiences and you've sort of packaged that and presented that to a viewer as opposed to like, this is what I saw. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's an accumulation of experiences over several weeks. Yes. And that's, that's the thing for me, 
Um, and I know it's different for every person in their practice. There's no right way to go about making a painting or anything else, except that you do it true to who you are and, and what makes sense to you. But what makes sense to me, even though at times it is challenging, um, I get so much from being on site. And I think that all of those uh, changes in the weather, the heat, the the mosquitoes, whatever it is, the wind, um, they kind of, I think they kind of distract my more intellectual or critical mind, uh, my language mind, because that's what leaves me first is language. And, and that then allows me to stay in the painting process and just slowly evolve, as you said, an experience or a re it's really a relationship with me to the subject and to what's being made. That's kind of my whole vibe right now. Although I do think, Kevin, that's going to change because these 60 by 60 panels, um, they're getting, I mean, I am still able to move them out by myself, but when it's windy, it's really hard. And then um, I'm going to be making a couple paintings that are bigger than that. And those are, I'm going to have to rely on something else because I won't be able to move those in and out as easily and get them on site. And I don't know what that's going to be. I just, I'm, I'm excited for that. I I'm terrified. I'm excited. <laughs> we'll see can, where it goes. Can you, um, I hope that this question turns out in a more positive light, but can you talk about some of your worst experiences plein air painting and did they possibly oh. yield really interesting experiences afterwards? Oh yeah. I mean, there have been so many times when the easel goes down the painting totally gets you know whatever's ruined so to speak but um I I never really see that as a as a detriment I mean I did I was painting a 60 wide a 40 48 by 60 on the shore of Lake Michigan it was like my third day in uh, it was windier that day than any other day. I had this huge log, driftwood log, that was anchoring my easel. Um, even with that, the painting took a nosedive right into the sand. <laughs> just big, wet painting, lots of sand, just pissed off, mad. You know, like I had to carry, then carry this huge, wet painting filled with sand back to my car, which I don't know, the beach looks almost the same anywhere you go. But for some reason, I had to trek this thing <laughs> way up the beach. So I'm carrying it back. I got it in the car, got it home. And I just was like, why am I even trying to do this? Scrape the whole thing back, just scraped, scraped, scraped the whole thing back. And uh, because I had, that was my third day painting, it actually looked really pretty good. <laughs> so then I went back and I thought, okay, I can get this. So I kept, kept painting, but that was, that was really a big one. Uh-huh. And yeah. Hey, you're in, you're in good company. I've seen a John Singer Sargent painting that he did of a friend. Uh, uh, I don't know if it was a friend or like a brother-in-law or something, but he's lying on the beach and you can see in the paint there's yeah. sand. So it's like, oh. that's the real deal. He was doing it on site on location yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. when I was teaching in Door County this last season um I teach workshops up there and we were on the water in Peninsula State Park and I was just doing a little demo I do I like to do these paint along demos so they paint along with me and they use my palette so I just squeeze out lots of paint I mix all the color they see me mix the color but then they get to dip right into mine they make their own paintings well this cloud of little tiny midges just like descended on us and all of our paintings were just crusted with like every every place there was a midge just stuck right in the painting and they were it was funny it was frustrating but very memorable <laughs> it's like pointillism but it's midgeism <laughs> <laughs> right exactly yeah exactly yeah well you've definitely uh paid your dues in terms of Land, landscape painting and so you get street cred there yeah I don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, last thing uh do you have any shout outs or any people you'd like to thank um this I I want to thank you for being such a good guest and it's been so good hearing all the things you've had to say about painting but uh who would you like to thank oh 
Gee, um, for, well, first you, Kevin, it's just such a pleasure seeing you again and talking with you and all of your accomplishments. Thank you for having me as part of your podcast. Um, I'm going to, I mean, I wasn't, I, I'm gonna, I'll thank my husband, my kids, all the people that we would normally thank, my parents, everybody who's been on my journey. But um, I'm going to do a little shout out today just because we were talking about the Hudson River Fellowship. And I also got a, a fellowship to La Napoule in France, both uh, through the Grand Central Atelier in New York. And the three people there that I'm doing my shout out to are Katie Whipple, uh, Ted Minoff, and the wonderful painter, Travis Schlott, who, um, wow, I just, I love the air in his paintings. And I feel like I have so much to say about those paintings, but um, they, they've really made a difference to me and uh, I, I appreciate their work. So I'll say that today. Great. Yeah. Painting air. I mean, yeah, oil paint can become anything, right? Even air. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's for him. It's like he, he puts a stroke down and then he leaves a cushion of air and then puts another stroke down. So you feel between the paint strokes that there's like some, something else going on really, really crazy. Oh, and another big shout out all former students. Cause I have lots of years of teaching. So. Yeah. 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 You, you, it, it just seems like yesterday that I was in your painting class and you were opening up all of the windows and reading us poetry as the winds from like Michigan <laughs> battered us and, oh. and it, we were freezing. And I remember the poem was about fish. <laughs> oh yeah, the Pablo Neruda. <laughs> I remember <Yeah>. that. <laughs> so, wow, you've got a great memory. <laughs> well, so I, I probably should remember the poet the poem better, but um, that's okay. The fact that you remember fish, that's good. <laughs> but 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 you you gave it like you always tried to make painting an uh, experience that transcended the visual. Yeah. Uh, and I remember we did things that were wacky that were also just so inspirational. For example, you had us on the, like uh, it was the first day of spring, we had to take off our shoes and we walked in the grass with our eyes closed and we had to really embrace those sensations. And so those are the things that good paintings transcend beyond the visual they they make us feel more human and they keep us in touch with that yeah i think we have to feel somehow feel our connection to one another to the earth to the experience before we can even with all the skill sets intact before we can honestly start to really convey it to figure out what do we love about our lives you know what what is it that we love about our lives and there's a lot to love there's a lot to not be so happy about but <laughs> to love your life it's it's a beautiful thing and to be sad sometimes is important too i want i want to give a shout out to your uh essay about your painting of the um bird and sometimes oh, yeah. it's okay to be sad that's in was that in realism yeah realism uh, today nature morte to paint a dead bird yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. it, that sometimes that somber note is exactly what we need. And, mm -hmm. and, and it does, again, speak to, you know, having a real experience, a real relationship, because Kevin, if, if you're doing that in your painting or your sculpture or your music or writing, whatever it is you're taking on, if it's a real relationship, then you are going to explore the full impact of the human condition. And sometimes you explore the same in, within the same work, you explore the deepest joy and the deepest woe. You know, those those can coincide in in a work of art. And um and and that's you know that's the reality of of our our of our lives, of our experience. So yeah, we don't it's not to sugarcoat anything or be a Pollyanna about too much. There the reality is we can hold um these opposing you know, contradictions within us and and explore that full realm of the human condition that we are always subject to. We're always all subject to that. So yeah, the more real you can be, honest you can be, 
the integrity shows in the work, I think. Agreed. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bethann. Thank you, Kevin. Wonderful to see you. Yeah, you too.